Okay, hello again everyone, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get the webinar started. And my name is Jay Schmidt, I'm going to be presenting this for you today. I'm a research solution specialist here at Mindware. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with this webinar. Okay, so just to begin, um, we're going to cover a few things here. Uh, during the webinar, one of them is going to be an introduction, like what is impedance. We're going to configure the application a few different ways, show you which uh, settings might be preferred one over the other. We're also going to look at actually processing the impedance signal, cleaning some data, and then we'll actually um, export and show you the Excel output. Finally, we're going to have a Q&A at the end, which should be about 15 minutes. Okay, so during the webinar, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask as soon as you have them, but we're not going to actually answer them until the Q&A portion at the end. This right here will show you on your uh, GoToWebinar how to actually ask those questions. We have a staff of people here kind of taking these in, answering these, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. But if, it, if you're not responding to it right away, don't worry about it. We'll get to it. And if we run out of time, we will then uh, follow up with you um, via email. Okay, so during this uh, entire webinar, what I'm going to cover is sort of the common settings or the common uses. Uh, that you might find yourself not every single detail, but just the, uh, <clears throat> the most common settings. So um, as long as uh, the quality is good and everything works with this webinar, what we're going to do is we're going to post it to our support site a few days, uh, maybe a week or two afterwards, and then you guys can review it at that point in time. Okay, so before we actually jump into everything, I just wanted to highlight a few things here. We have a very good blog post um, about impedance that our software engineer Eric Morgan has created for us. Uh, he did a very good job on it and there's a six part series at that uh, web address you see here. We also have very, um, very well put together user guides and manuals that you can access directly from the applications. So you can see here within all of our applications you can go to help user guide or if you're actually on a specific screen you can kind of hover your mouse over that, hit Control H, and then it should actually take you to the manual and that part of the manual that actually relates to what you're looking at. So definitely check both of these out. A lot of the things we're covering, I'm going to basically say, you know, hey, this is covered more in the manuals or this is in the actual um, blog post, so be sure to check those out at some point. And on the right here, you can see there's a six-part series on impedance. A lot of this will come from those things, so it uh, should be directly relatable. Okay, so now we're going to actually cover the impedance signal, other signals um, that are associated with it that we're going to collect at the same time, most likely, and uh, go through those. So the first is actually an ECG. So a lot of the times when we're collecting uh, cardiothoracic impedance, we're also going to collect ECG or EKG, the same thing. And we're going to do that um, because we're going to use those uh, landmarks to actually correlate the two together. So in ECG, we're looking at the electrical properties of the heart. We're looking at that sinoatrial node. We're looking at that um, electrical property. And then in impedance, we're going to look at the mechanical properties. So here we can see that we're basically looking for this defined R peak. And we get this with the lead two configuration in this morphology. And you can see that over here where we have a ECG sensor on the right clavicle and then one on the left rib. We also have a ground. So in impedance, what we're going to do is we're going to add four more sensors for our setup. We're going to put two on the chest of the person and two on the back. And so these sensors on the back are actually going to um, pass through the current, and then the two white ones on the front are going to receive that. And why this is very important and why we would want to do both these measures together is a few. Um, there are some statistics that we absolutely need. We have to have ECG um, to get those in impedance. Also, if we're going to look at the autonomic nervous system, so with high frequency variability, we can get the parasympathetic side of things from heart rate variability. In impedance, we're actually going to be looking at the sympathetic side of things. And so if we put both of those together, we can actually get a full picture of that subject's autonomic nervous system. And, you know, historically, measuring sympathetic and parasympathetic activity in the same organ allows for more like direct comparison model generation. Um, historically, we kind of, it was proposed there was sort of like a um, homeostatic, or it would if the sympathetic activity would go up, then you might think the parasympathetic would go down. 
And it turns out this is probably just like an oversimplification of the ANS. And we now know that they can act independently from one another. And um, it's always a lot more powerful if we can get that, um, both of those sides of the ANS from the same organ. We, there's a bunch of different factors we don't have to worry about if we do that. So um, by studying both these measures together, looking at both those things at the heart um, just becomes a little bit more powerful. And uh, down here and in this graphic, what I'm showing you is actually a derivative of the impedance waveform, but this is mostly what we actually work with during the analysis. So right here, I'm, I'm kind of highlighting the B notch, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And then again, yeah, we have the um, all about cardiac impedance block series that I covered in the previous slide. OK, finally, uh, the last thing we're going to cover is respiration here. So there's a few ways we can get respiration. You know, for heart rate variability, we actually need the respiration just to validate our respiratory sinus arrhythmia measure, or RSA. It doesn't actually go into the calculation, but we just need to see that um, normal amount of breath cycles were taken during that time. In impedance, we don't really need that so much, but one of the more um, interesting things we can do with this is we can actually derive respiration from the impedance waveform. So you might be familiar with having a measure respiration with a belt that you put across a person's chest. And if we're collecting impedance, we can actually drive that. We don't have to use the belt, and we don't have to um, add anything else to that subject. So it's just a little bit cleaner, and it makes it a little bit easier to get that information. OK, introduction to impedance. So we're just going to go into the basics here of exactly what we're doing with our impedance. So what we're doing is we're transmitting a high frequency current from those back sensors. So they're shown here as red. Those are actually being placed in the back. And that current is going to uh, transfer through the thorax of that person. And then it's going to follow a path of least resistance, which due to the blood is going to be mostly found in the aorta, vena cava, and superior and inferior. So that's all in the heart. And so all of this current is going to focus in on that area. These two front sensors now, the white ones that were shown here, are going to receive that. And depending on if there's blood or not, we all know um, basically the resistance of that current. And so that is actually how we're tracking the blood flow, how we know when the left aortic valve opens, when the blood's ejected, all of that information is from this. OK, so here on the top, we have our Z0, Z0, if you will. And um, people call it a few different things, but it's pronounced Z0. And this is our raw impedance waveform. So you'll see this a few times throughout the application, but we don't really do too much with it. Um, it's more or less the derivative down here, the DZDT. And this is looking at that, um, that Z0 waveform and then changing over it in relative to time. So it's basically the distance and then time for that. And that's what we'll actually be analyzing and editing. OK. so. Just a few common points on the DZDT uh, derivative uh, here. So the B point, that's actually when that, that, that aortic valve actually opens up. And then blood is ejected um, from that ventricle. It'll already be collapsed, but the blood will eject out of there and then go into the aorta. The Z point, that's that maximal um, point of all of that flow. And then the X point is basically the ending. So if the beginning was B, and then X would be the end when that valve actually closes, and then that cycle. Um, repeats. OK, so uh, going through impedance processing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a few slides that I've already kind of put into PowerPoint, so it's a little bit easier to see. And then after we go through these settings, we'll go into the application, mess around with it a little bit, and actually do some editing. OK, so common statistics that people are looking at with impedance cardiography is Pre-ejection period and your left ventricle ejection time. Pre-ejection period probably being by far the most important thing we're looking at here. And what that is is the timing from that start command um, of that ECG signal. We're representing that in red here. And so that'll be our, our Q point. And we're looking at the latency from that over to our B point, so when that valve actually opens. So different waveforms that we're looking at here, but the time between those two, pre-ejection period. And then finally, the left ventricle ejection time is over represented here on X as when that valve closed. So we can kind of know the timing between when it opened and when it closed. That's also important to us. Finally, we have volumetric measures such as stroke volume, 
um, how much blood is being pumped out each beat, and then cardiac output, which is um, basically the same thing with the heart rate considered. And you can see that here um, down in LVET, so that's our B tax. Okay, so with impedance, there's going to be some things we're going to do to make this data actually cleanable and work with it. And one of the um, things we're going to do is we're going to take all of these different cycles, which you can see here represented in blue, and we're going to average all of these together and put them into one ensemble average, which is seen over here as the blue waveform. And this just helps us a lot with any sort of movement artifact or respiration that might be missing up the individual cycles to go in there and try to edit every single one would be very tedious. And so this is a way we can get the same information, but um, average them all together. And any small changes are kind of less important, but it's still powerful. So this is how this system works. As far as uh, ensemble time windows, so what we're going to do there is we're actually looking at how we can determine the amount of data surrounding each RP. So normally we're going to set this as a default value of 200 milliseconds. And then the ensemble length is also is going to be 750. So if we look down here in this picture, we can see the ensemble start time. And then we can see the length here in the orange. And so normally you're going to leave these here. Um, if you needed to adjust it at any point, it's normally because you're studying um, someone with a very high, uh, very fast heart rate, and so you need to change that. But most of the time, these are these are fine just as they are. Okay, so what we're going to cover now is the algorithms that you're going to most likely change on a day-to-day -day basis if you do change any, and probably the most important one again um, for pre-ejection period is going to be uh, what your B point algorithm. So there's just one rule with this and which is, can we see the B notch or not? And so what I mean by notch is, a lot of people will express this differently, but if you look here on this waveform, it's going up in pretty normal fashion, and then it has a little bit of a shelf here, and it continues back up to Z. And so what this is is actually the point at which that um, valve is actually opening up. And so we want to make sure that that B point is placed right there. And so if we can see this, then we'll use one of these algorithms, such as the um, percent DZT, I'm sorry, one of, or the uh, max slope or max slope change, because it'll actually detect that. Um, but if we can't see it, then usually we're going to go with percent DZD plus a time constant of 4 milliseconds. But for this one, since we can see it, this algorithm works best. On this one, we can see that we cannot see this. It's just not visible, it just goes straight up. So in that instance, we want to estimate um, where that B would be. And we'll look at this a little bit um, further here, but what we can see is we have these parameters on either side of this B that are also in green. And this is based off of a large data set of physiologically possible locations for that valve to open up based off of the subject's heart rate. So it actually looks at each person's heart rate and says, okay, this is probably where that valve could open up. Um, it's not actually affecting that B point estimation. Um, it just is normally falls right around it just because that algorithm is so good at detecting where that B should be. Um, for if you have very messy data, this can be this can come in handy because uh, you know maybe the B is very much farther when it should be and it doesn't fall within that regulation. That that might let you know, okay, this is a segment I shouldn't use. Okay, and then for the LVET, again, this is one that you're probably not going to change, um, but this is basically a 3 and 600 millisecond offset um, with the, the devolved center of Framingham. And um, if you can, if in an event that like the X point cannot be precisely identified, what you're going to notice is, I have it highlighted up here in the top red, that section will actually turn red for you and letting you know that you need to move that. Uh, so if we can see down here in the bottom right, this window is basically going to look for the lowest kind of point between that amount of time. That's that. 300, second, 300 millisecond window, and it's going to put that X at the lowest point. Now, there are certain situations in which the next complex is butting up against it, at which point we need to reduce our window size for the ensemble length, as we covered before. Uh, it's also possible that there just isn't a dip in that window. It might fall outside of that LVET window, and so that's one reason it might turn red for you, and at which point um, you could consult with somebody or um, adjust it to that lowest point. Most of the time, though, it's pretty easy for the algorithm to detect that lowest point and it places it right there without a problem.
Okay, so um, one more thing just to cover here on our calibration settings page. You do want to make sure if you're looking to report on volume, so those two I covered before, stroke volume, crank output, if you want to look at those statistics, it's very important that during acquisition, the experimenter measures the distance between these two white sensors because we need to know how um, tall that person is, basically, or how big their thorax is. It depends on how much blood they might have. So do make sure that you're um, recording that distance. And then you'll actually put it right into the impedance calibration um, front right there. If you are doing band electrodes, then we can change that over. I'll show you that in a second. But for most of the people, um, we're doing spot, so we just have that front distance there. OK, so now we're going to actually uh, transfer over to looking at the application. So I will pull that up for you. So when we first get the application open, um, it's going to pull up this window here, which is asking me to look for a file. So there's a few different files that we can take. Uh, one of those is our MWI file. That's what most of you will be working with. We also have our older MW mineware file structure. We can take in um, acknowledge files, EDF, and BDF types. So when we're looking at this, it's kind of going to filter most of them for us and leave us the MWI, even though in most of the instances, you'll have that raw data, that MWX file. But we're almost always going to work only with the MWI file, as far as analysis goes. So I'm going to go ahead and load this up. First thing we're going to see is this channel mapping screen. It's basically where we tell the application what waveform is what. We can also see here that we have our edited data file path. So if we had previously edited this data or these data and we needed to load that back in to finish it or just to confirm something, we can just load another type of file you'll see. That new type of file is an EDI. Um, it's an edited data file, as you can see here. EDI is the I is for impedance, H is for heart rate, and we have other ones for other applications. The EDI2 is the new structure for the 3.2 series of our applications. So if we wanted to, we could load that and see what we did before. For right now, I'm going to leave that off. So right now, all we need to do is leave this on new, and we need to tell the application where these um, channels are. So ECG um, as bio one. In our, with our mobiles, um, it's usually helpful to label these as such, so it's a little bit more intuitive when you're going to do analysis. I didn't do that, but so it says bio one. Um, these other ones here, we're just kind of matching exactly what they say. So set up properly, um, that would also say ECG. OK, so uh, now we're going to go into uh, just a few of these options here. I'm going to briefly cover the events and modes. We're mostly going to look at time mode. Um, and then we'll actually go into analyzing the data. So again, we could open up another file if we wanted to by clicking this. We can go back to that same channel mapping screen if we needed to change that instead of having to load the file again. Um, we can actually look at the file info and see the sampling frequency of every one of these channels. This isn't as important with if you're using files that were collected with one of our systems because that's all sa sampled the same frequency. Uh, however, if you're bringing in something from a different system, such as Acknowledge File. Um, Biohack does sample at different frequencies, so we can observe that here if necessary. OK, uh, configurations. So this is something I highly recommend everyone use. And what we can do with this is, after we have everything set here, we know the mode we're going to use, our calibration settings are set, um, our peak and artifact settings, just everything in here. We can save that configuration. And then as soon as you open another file, basically like what we just did, the next thing I would do is open that configuration file. And then no matter what anybody did before you, if they came in and they changed these settings, it will reset them to what we had before. And so that's pretty important on um, you know, not making everyone check through every single box and kind of making sure everything's accurate. Obviously, for impedance, we still want to make sure that we change the front electrode distance for each subject. And finally, we have the user guide that I showed you guys in that image before. We have our support site. This will take you straight to our um, support site. Um, the feedback, this will, if you need to give any information to us, 
check for updates. So as long as the computer that has the application is installed on the internet, it'll every time you open it up, it'll check for you. You can also manually check right there. And then finally, if you were if you didn't have the application yet and you were looking to try it out, you can actually click on uh, download demo, da demo data. This will take you to our downloads folder, and from there you can download a, a demo data set. You can download this entire application and run it in demo mode, and um, and check it out for free. And then finally, about just tells you the version of the application and such. Okay, so events and modes. We have some events here. We see I used a MindWeb Mobile to collect this data, and I have a few event buttons that I pressed in there. Um, we're for the just for the purposes of getting through everything, we're going to actually just look at time mode here. We're going to look at 60 second segments, um, which you can adjust here. We do have plenty of other modes available, such as event. We can drag these over. We can do multi-event and a bunch of different things, splitting these up so we can keep our segment time the same. Uh, we can do a lot of different modes here. If you guys wanted some more specific information on that, because it is a little bit different than our last ones, again, you can hit Control H right now, and that will take you to the manual, and it should take you straight down to the part of the manual that covers the event mode. So, demo that for you. So I hit Control H, take me to the manual, and it scrolled all the way down to 7.121, and here we are in event modes. And uh, basically went through and we have a pretty good graphics here of exactly what each mode would do. Okay, the calibration settings. So I already showed you some screenshots here. I'm not going to cover too much more here, but I did want to show you the spot and band settings. So again, we, if you do band, you're going to also want to take the, uh, the back uh, distance for those because you're basically going to have two things that you need to measure with those to make sure your measurement is constant around that person's chest. But again, we're, we're going to look at spot here. Um, for all of these different things, if you had questions about the different ones that you might want to use, again, that manual is going to be extremely helpful because all of this is laid out there perfectly. And then we do have the blog post. We're going to talk over those as well. We have in either the blog post or the manual, for almost all of this stuff, there are links there from the papers, the scientific journals that we got all the algorithms from. So you can check it right there too. Uh, the show range here, that is that the B point, um, we had the two, the high and low, where we would expect that uh, B notch to end up. If you didn't want to see that in your analysis, you could turn that off, but normally it's helpful to keep that on. And then finally, we do have the invert uh, ECG and uh, DZDT. So inverting DZDT probably is only going to be used if you're bringing in a file from a different system, as ours should always be positive. Um, inverting ECG, so in our old applications, we would ask you every single time, you open an application, is this inverted or is it not? With this, um, if you've noticed that a bunch of the files are inverted, or for this specific one, you don't want to have to keep opening it, you can just click this, and then it'll just make sure they're all inverted for you. And we can go over that again in just a second. Okay, uh, RP and artifact settings. So the IVI min-max check, this is uh, just simply checking the interview interval falls above or below a specified heart rate threshold. So if it does, then it'll be flagged as a potential artifact. And uh, the default values here, as you can see, um, they're 200 to 40. Unless you're um, sure that your uh, beats per minute is above or below that, I would leave these, as it'll be a little bit more accurate. But if you need to, you can adjust them there. Uh, to actually check the heart rate, we can hit Analyze here at the bottom, check out the heart rate, and come back and uh, confirm that. But this should, this should uh, encapsulate almost all of your subjects. Um, so that's normally something that you'll just leave on. The MADMAD is, is basically going to place some bounds on the variability of the inner beat um, intervals. So from beat to beat, it'll like flag these if it exceeds a certain time. Okay, the baseline and uh, muscle noise filter, this is one another thing that we're just going to kind of leave on and forget about it, but what it's going to do is put a bandpass filter from about 0.5 hertz to 45 hertz, and um, this will just ha help isolate the frequencies, components of where we're observing and leaving everything else out. So kind of frequencies that aren't really possible, we're going to ignore those, and then we're only going to focus on the ones that uh, could contain that data. So no, another thing we're going to leave on. Uh, notch filter. So for those of you that have collected before, 
there's some instances if someone's touching a power cord or they're by a transformer or something like that, you can get some electrical interference in your data, which makes everything look pretty fuzzy. And so by turning on this notch filter, um, that'll get rid of either 60 hertz in North America, if you're looking at European data, they're at 50 hertz. And um, it'll remove that, and then you can continue to do your analysis. If you needed more information, if you weren't sure if you had um, some electrical interference or not, we do have uh, an article, or a few articles, actually, that I can show you here. Uh, these right here, Improvement Data Quality for ECG, will show you um, if you have 60 hertz on your ECG. And then finally, we do have the one for impedance as well. So if you clicked on those, you would see um, examples of what that might look like, and then you can confirm it or not. Uh, finally, down here, um, ignoring estimated beats. So what we can do is we can edit these data in heart rate variability analysis. And in that program, we're gonna, some of the beats we're going to say are estimated. Whether we just don't know if it's there or not, we're sort of guessing, interpolating a little bit. Uh, we're having a mid-beat between two points, anything like that, where we can't say emphatically that that's where that beat occurred. We could um, turn this on, and we can actually use the edits that we did in HRV and pull them into impedance. By turning this ignore, uh, ignoring estimated beats on, what it's going to do is it's going to automatically not include any of those ones that we were saying we weren't sure. We were we're estimating. And in impedance, um, there aren't the same kind of like temporal restrictions that there are in hard variability. So in HRV, we need like, it's suggested we have at least 30 seconds of continuous data. And in impedance, we don't have that regulation. So we can just kind of delete seg um, part pieces and parts out as needed to get rid of um, you know, noise or motion artifacts. So this right here will kind of do that for you automatically. I can also show, I'm going to show you on the, uh, when we hit analyze and go into the analysis, I'll show you a way that you can also do this in the impedance application, but really if you're doing both of these things, it's just quite a bit faster um, to bring those edits in. So I will leave that off for now, but that might be something you would want to consider. Uh, we do have an article, another article I'll show you here, which is heart rate variability, HRV versus impedance, so heart rate variability, impedance, uh, why are we editing twice? And this will go through some details on why we might be able to preserve some of the data that we couldn't use in HRV, but we can use it in impedance. Um, and then those, those timing uh, regulations I was talking about before. So definitely check this guy out. And then finally, I'm not going to touch too much here, but this is how we would load videos. If you had a synchronous uh, audio video captured, you can do up to four of them. And we can, you can sync it right here. Um, plus or minus up to the millisecond, and then uh, have that video set up for you. If it's a system, then you got, we also have an audio video that we provide, and that's automatically synced for you. So um, either way you can do that, but this is how you load those. And then finally, the output setting is simply where, um, by default, your data is going to be stored. So unless you tell it to go somewhere else, it's going to save it in the same folder as those Visio files that you're loading and it's going to be under an output um, data folder. You label it as such. Okay, so again, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these data in just time mode with 60 second segments, but if anybody did want to do event-related analysis, um, do check out the manual. And we also have a webinar we did on events and modes that can be uh, pretty helpful on our support site. But let's go ahead and actually start analyzing these data. Okay, so this first plot, I'm going to go through these settings here in a second, but I'm just going to explain generally everything we're looking at. So this first plot here is just our raw ECG and DZDT waveform. So again, that DZDT is that first derivative of our impedance waveform, and it's actually going to so show us cycle by cycle, um, these cardiac cycles. The IBI series is going to be um, the time in between these beats. So we're looking, again, electrical properties, we're looking at the red ECG here. The timing between these two blue is going to be our IBI, or interbeat interval, and that's what we see here. So it's just the timing between those. And how we use this is, if there's any very dramatic and sharp points in this, that's probably a section of the data that we also want to look at a little bit closer above. We want to hit edit ours, and we want to look at it closer. Um, normally, when you see something that's, it, it would be, you know, 
quite a bit taller or um, you know higher or lower than the rest of the data you would see here. Uh, you'll also notice there's a yellow uh, star basically above, and then that's something that will also cue you. So it's just an additional cue you can kind of use to be like, oh wow, there's some huge dip here. I need to go actually look at my data and see if I need to make some edits there. And then ensemble averaging, what we're doing with that is, I kind of already explained it to you guys before, but we're taking all of these different cycles, both the ECG and the DZT, we're going to put them into an average, aggregate average here, and we're going to make these two waveforms. And then from here, if there are any individual problems, like you can see here, um, right around 21 seconds, and again, right around 26 seconds, there's probably some movement artifact, if I had to guess. And uh, just from person shifting or something like that, and so if we, if we take the average of all of these together, these um, cycle by cycle changes aren't as important, that they don't um, infiltrate the data as much and we can preserve everything. So that's why we have everything assembled together. Um, over on the right here are our different statistics. We will cover that in a little bit, um, but we've already looked at the LVET and PEP stroke volume cardiac output. I've already explained those. And, um, the Z naught, this is going to be basically your average right there, average cardiac impedance in ohms. DZT max is going to be in ohms per second. Um, that has something to do with time. We have our heart rate and then our mean interview interval, our mean time in between the beats for the subject. Uh, we also have um, MAP, MAP, and TPR. So that's mean arterial pressure and total peripheral resistance. So if you were collecting a continuous um, blood pressure at the same time, we can load those data into our, our blood pressure variability application, clean them. We can then export to the Excel file, load that Excel file into the impedance application. Right. We'll click that and then it'll ask us to load that. And then um, we can actually get those statistics there. And then finally we have the number of R peaks, so just count the number of R peaks in this segment. And this over here is our location of all these different points. So if we look over here, we have our Q, R, S, and then over on the DZT, we have B, Z, and X. And so it's just basically giving you the amplitude and then time location of those. And we'll look at the ensemble averages a little bit closer in the editor in a second. Okay, so at the top, a uh, few new features to 3.2 that we didn't have before. Uh, we have saving edits, and we can save them as if we needed to create multiple versions of it. If you were like, I don't know if it should be this way or this way, but you want to do the work and then confirm it with somebody, that's a good um, use of the save edits as. If we didn't get through the entire file, we were editing and then we had to go and come back, we can save everything and then actually open that output later and continue our edits uh, seamlessly. And I'll show you that in a second. Writing segments, so it, we can do that in a few ways. We can write it out right here, or we can actually come out to file and write that segment. We can write all segments if we'd like, but I'd probably caution you on writing all segments unless you've already looked through all the data as, you know, it really needs to be visually inspected, not just automatically written. It's not going to make any decisions if we do this. It's just going to write it out. Uh, searching, okay, so this is, a, again, another new feature that we have in 3.2. And so if we go down to find next, what you can see is I can, if I've already written this before, um, for one, I w this would come up and say that it had been written before. But what I can do is I can say, okay, let me find the next unwritten segment. So I haven't opened this file before, so it's like, well, the next one is the next one um, that hasn't been written yet. So that's helpful. Uh, it, but again, if we were loading this file before, and I'll show you in a second, um, it would automatically skip to that next segment. So it saves you a lot of time and you don't have to, you know, um, refer to some Excel sheet that says, oh, I stopped at 17 and begin at 18 and there's confusion. So um, that's a pretty handy feature. And you can see all of these hotkeys uh, next to the actual thing. So you can actually hit control shift right and then it'll do the same thing. Uh, we can also find the next artifact. So I don't, I do not believe So it's looking through. Okay, so this entire file, there aren't any artifacts. So this is pretty good data, right? Eight segments, 60 seconds, there's no problems. Um, that's probably not what you're gonna find. Um, there's usually a problem or two, but this is pretty helpful. And again, we'll go over that in a little bit and show you how that works, but 
um, finding previous, and we can do the same thing. So anything forward or behind where we are. Uh, viewing, so point distribution. So what this is doing uh, is the one thing I didn't cover on here. If we look at peaks. So if we come back down here to the bottom right, we have a few different uh, bins with percentages here. So this first one is all of the beads that are being identified as good beads by the different algorithms. So 100% of them, all 63 are good. The second one here is going to be anything that we estimated. So if we come in to HRV, and again, we're going to load that edited data file with those edits on there, we'll know which ones are estimated, and they'll automatically be put into that bin. And then finally, this last one is going to be any artifacts. So if there's any artifacts in our data, they'll show up there. So before I actually go into this, let me back out, and I will show everyone how to load that edited data file that I keep talking about. So again, we would, um, I've already, you know, edited in this thing, so I can just go back to the map channels, and then I will say I have an existing data file, and then we pull up that ED, in this case it's EDI2, uh, but we'll, we'll load that edit data file. It's going to gray out our um, channels here so that we don't change them. And it's very important that when we load the edit data file, uh, we don't change anything else, especially between the modes or anything because that could impact your data. So just another good reason why it might be helpful to use those configuration files so we can be sure that we're analyzing the same mode, the same settings. But okay, I've loaded the edited data file and now we'll get back into the application. So okay, good. So now what we've done, I've entered an artifact here on the third segment and then I also have uh, entered a mid beat on the fifth segment. So I wanted to show you how some of these features work. So find the next uh, unwritten segment. Um, I haven't done that yet. We can do that. So I saved, I wrote out the first two segments in Excel. So I came in here and hit right, number two, hit right. So I've done that already. I can uh, open that output. And again, that output directory, if we go in there. So if we pretend that this is your um, subject's raw data, so here's your MWI, there's your MWX, the raw data. Here's these two folders, so there's where my edit data is being contained. And then here's my output data, which is where my Excel file is. So anyways, I will uh, load that output data. And now we can do this. We can actually say, okay, show me the next unwritten data segment. It's going to search. The first two have been done. It jumps right to the third. The other thing we can do is we can go to um, find the next artifact. So again, that should search the first two, there's nothing there, and then all of a sudden it stops us on third segment because that's where it's uh, determined the next artifact is. And again, artifacts are being shown as these yellow circles, and so we have, it's saying we have two there that are making up 3.4% of our total data. Um, so again, in heart rate variability, you know, we have that 30 second rule where we need 30 seconds of continuous data for our say to be valid. In impedance, we don't have that same thing, um, and, you know, also in, in heart rate variability, we have a 10% rule, which is saying that we really don't want to edit more than 10% of the data. And so that's why these percentages um, become very important to you, because if you have artifacts, we can deal, we can deal with those in most cases and clean those up. Um, but right here, if we have, um, you know, more than 10% of them are being estimated, then that's probably an instance in which we just don't want to use that segment, because it's too messy. So anyways, yeah, the search uh, find next artifact took us right to the um, next problem here. And then we can make a decision, which we will do in a second. Um, and then I wanted to show you also the mid beat. So I basically, this algorithm did do it correctly, but I deleted it and then I put in a mid beat, which is basically the mathematical middle between these two good peaks, puts it here at zero. And then um, what that's basically doing is removing any, any variability because Let's say during that time there was motion artifact, we can't say exactly where that RP occurred, and so we're just kind of splitting the difference and saying, okay, don't count this one, no variability between the two, but we have all of these other um, 60, well, 59 R peaks um, that do have that high frequency variability we're looking for. But anyways, this is really a lot less important in uh, impedance because we can just delete sections as we need to. Um, but I did want to show you if we made an edit in HRV, brought it in, what that might look like. 
But okay, so let's actually go into the editor and we can start to edit the state a little bit. Um, let's go ahead and skip to our third segment where we have that problem. So this is this is pretty easy. Uh, I just put that beat in there uh, manually, but what we can do is we have our delete function here. It creates a little circle for us. We can expand, contract this by our mouse wheel, or we can move this sensitivity bar. And then what we want to do is really want to localize on the problem and then delete that portion. And you'll notice the delete is still depressed, and so we'll want to uncheck that before we move around. Uh, other things on here you'll see before we can save, save as. Uh, we have a new feature in all of our applications, which is undo and redo, where we can actually exactly what we just did. We can undo that edit, um, or we can redo it and see what, how that affects the data. So uh, as soon as we leave this screen, though, and go back to the other editor, um, we will need to have everything there. We can make some edits, go back to the other screen, come back in, and then hit undo. It's, it's only while we're actually editing live, um, but it's still very helpful to kind of be able to make that change and see how it affects everything. Undo, redo all. Um, same thing here. Uh, we can uh, view data edits. So um, what that's basically looking at is that those different percentages. Um, down here, if we were actually moving, if we were removing some of the data, or if we were splining data together, um, that would actually affect these uh, data edits down here. More likely than not, what you're probably going to be interested in is your point distribution. Um, your peaks, and that's going to give you those different percentages that we saw on the previous screen. So if you needed to see, like, okay, I'm at 9%, and I know I'm not supposed to go to 10 or above, um, then you can kind of keep an eye on that and see how much of your data is being estimated. And then, again, we have a user guide and support site and then feedback, as we do on the other screen. Uh, other things up here in the channels, so you'll see that we have ECG, that's our red, um, Z naught, that's going to be our orange, that's our raw impedance waveform, and then we have DZDT in blue. So what we can do with this is, in the mode, we have three different options now. We can edit, view, or hide these. And so if this is just too much stuff for you to look at, let's say, okay, I'm not really editing the Z naught anyways, um, I don't want to see that. And then we can remove that from the screen. We can also do things such as um, make sure we're just viewing one so we can edit the other. So instance of that would be if we wanted to say view the Z naught and DZT, but we want to edit ECG, we leave it like this. And then when I make any edits, um, such as deleting all these points, it's only impacting the ECG. And same with the remove data. If we needed to remove the data for any reason, um, it will only impact that one that we're in edit mode on. But let's go ahead and undo everything we just did. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and leave these on edit. Cool. Okay, so um, next thing we have is we can insert the beat. So I showed you before. Here's how we delete a beat. Let's say that the algorithm missed one of the R peaks. To insert one, it's the same deal um, with the circle and the, and the uh, mouse wheel. And we just make sure that we're putting that peak in between that circle, and we hit insert. Uh, one thing you'll notice when we do this is that we do have this snapped peak on. And I'll go ahead and delete that and show you what would happen if we had that off. So now it's off. If I insert this peak, it's going to let it actually float to exactly where you put it. Um, you know, even if you get very close on the screen, if you zoom in, you'll see that you're way off. So it, in most instances, it's a good idea to leave the snapped peak on. Um, so we will do that. Okay, uh, last thing we can do, and I should show that. Um, we can actually estimate right from here. So if we were saying that we weren't sure that this RP occurred right there, we could, um, and actually I'm going to hide these here real quick. Okay, so uh, if we weren't sure that this occurred right here, we could put the estimate and then insert that beat right there. And you'll notice how that looks a little bit different. So it's still the blue circle, but it's got a little yellow crosshair on it. And that lets us know that it's estimated. And so if I jump back out of here, I can also click on this um, any point. So let's just say you opened it up and naturally there was an artifact there. It would look a little bit different. Obviously, it was just the yellow circle. Um, but you can actually click on this, and it'll give you some information as to why that's being flagged. 
you know, not just that it's a problem, but maybe what algorithm is not passing. And so here are two algorithms that we had on the previous page. And, it's, and for this one, it's going to say it's a good beat, it's passed and everything, um, but it is estimated because we hit that estimate button. Um, we can also change this over to a normal beat on the fly, just like that. And then that'll remove it and turn it back into a blue circle. Uh, and then, yeah, only peaks here for HRV. Um, mid beating. Uh, that's something I'm not going to cover too much in this. Um, this is really more of something that you would probably do in uh, the HRV application. In impedance, if we had a mid beat, that's an estimate, right? That's where we're just kind of splitting the difference. So we wouldn't want to, we would probably just remove the ECG for that time. If we remove the ECG, uh, we still have our uh, ZZT. If we remove the ECG and we remove these blue circles, so something like this, if we just delete every point between there, what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the statistics on everything with a peak only. So yellow or blue, it'll calculate on those. The ones that doesn't have any R peak, it's not going to calculate um, any impedance statistics for. So that's how we can kind of get around. If there's a messy part, I'm just going to delete that. I'm not going to mess around with mid beating and this and that. Um, because we ensemble all of these together, and that's why that's helpful. Um, but anyways, so for mid beating, um, what we do with this is we can come in here and let's delete these two points, right? So let's say that these two are missing. We put these X cursors on the outside of these known good R peaks. Uh, our new algorithm will automatically determine, um, based upon that amount of time, how many beats we might expect to see in between there. You'll see that it's automatic. It's um, estimating that we should have two peaks, and um, so all we would have to do is hit mid beat. Again, it's going to put them at the should put them normally at, at zero amplitude volts, but um, you'll notice they're estimated with those crosshairs on there. And this is perfectly valid edit to have um, both an HRV and impedance. Um, you know, we the peak or the uh, amplitude of this signal is really less important to us. It's all about the time in between these two. So this is fine. It's the same amount of time between those and we move forward. But again, something we probably won't do in impedance because we don't um, we don't need that continuous data stream that we do in high rate variability. Um, and then, yeah, we're moving data, splining. Uh, these are, again, probably things I just wouldn't recommend doing in this application, um, but if you wanted to, you can you can just go ahead and remove all of the data there. You'll see what that does. It's a little weird. It's it's hard to see what why you did that. Um, you'd have to go back and load that original, that MWX file, that raw data, and see why this was deleted. So normally, uh, it's quite a bit better uh, if we just remove the X's, or, or, or remove the R peaks, uh, sorry, X's. If we remove the R peak from that section, then we can still see the data. Even if it's very messy, it's just not being used. So this is probably a better um, way to remove anything that needs to be. Uh, cursors, X cursors, Y cursors. So this is just showing you have these two Y's here and the two X's, and this will give us our values there. If we ever needed to zoom in to see you know, exactly how long something was, or time between beats, we can align these over here. And then we can get our, our delta, which is our absolute value between the two. So about uh, 1100, sec or 1,100 milliseconds, a little over a second between these two. And the low and high, so it just depends on its relative to which one is left or right on the waveform. So if I move the low higher, it becomes the high cursor. You can see when I move that, the high is moving now. And same with the Y cursors. Uh, one uh, new feature that we added with the 3.2 series is if you're zoomed in here, you can actually use the uh, directional arrows on your keyboard. And you can go left and right, and that'll move it by exactly one second. So if you're trying to move through the file pretty quickly, like I knew I had a problem there, oh, I can do that. Um, stay at the same zoom window and just keep moving forward, which makes things quite a bit faster. Uh, other things here, so to move these around, so as you can see, what this is doing is it's deleting all the points between these. And um, what we can do is we can say that control is everything to the right, control or shift is everything, or everything to the right is sh uh, shift, control is everything to the left, and uh, them together deletes everything on the outside. So it's basically saying like what we want to delete uh, with these different algorithms. And um, that, that's pretty much it with those things. Uh, the ensemble editor, what we're going to do there is we're going to 
if you needed to ever move anything, uh, one of the things we'll do, as you can see here, that calculation method I chose, um, I think it's the percent to ZD plus time. It didn't get it quite right. Where we would actually want this B point to be would be on this trough here right before the upward infliction, so something like that. Um, again, uh, if you were following my directions at the beginning, it was, you know, if I could see that B notch, which is what this is, then we would want to use max slope or max slope change. Percent DZT plus time is it's just going to estimate. It got very close, but you really want it to be right here. So you could either go into every segment and move that, or you could go back to that, um, that uh, algorithm for B point location and change it over to something and see if that makes it better. It's usually if you have a very long acquisition, that'll be faster. And then uh, if we change anything, if we had a, um, if our Z was messed up or like a double hump or something like that, we can move it to where it should be and then recalculate the B based on that. And we can do that for all of these. So um, if we ever needed to move something, you can see how it's shifting um, where that B would be just by moving the Q because it's based off of that. So um, you can always recalculate and then see if that's more accurate. Okay, so finally uh, we can write it out to Excel. Again, I did that before, um, but we can go ahead and write it out again. I will pull up that file, output, data. And from here we can see I, I wrote out the first three segments. I did the first two previously. We get all of the statistics that were on those screens. We get the IBI, the time in between all of those beats, all of that uh, data is output here. Editing statistics, so um, if we had certain percentage of peaks that were normal, these were all 100%, um, but if we didn't then they would be in here as estimated or artifacts and then you could um, kind of keep an eye on to make sure you're not above that 10% uh, rule there. Roll there. Um, again, only really super popular or important with probably variability, but it's available here. And then finally, all of the different settings and algorithms that we chose. And I'm going to load uh, just one more file, and then we can get started on some questions here. And so I'm going to load that up. And I'm going to uh, show you some data that's not perfect. It's already been mapped for me, so I can jump right in. And you can see here that we actually have some areas where there's some the electrode came off of the subject. We just intentionally ripped this off. And um, so what we could do here is we could hit edit ours, and we could actually say, all right, from this point to this point, you can see this DZDT is not good, and then here it's just completely missing. So we could delete all of our cursors between this point. And again, if you notice the morphology of the DZDT here, it's kind of messed up, right? Uh, and then we could also delete the points over here. So we could say this one's also fell off. Okay, and we can do that. And then now all of a sudden we have our normal DCT ensemble average that we can edit. I, again, I would probably move the B a little bit over or change to the other algorithm because I can see that B notch. Um, but again, this would be another um, edit, edit that would be completely valid in the cadence. And then, of course, uh, if we didn't hit file save at the top, it'll ask us if we want to save those changes there. And that is um, everything that we're prepared to show you for the impedance application. So now we have a few minutes left. We have technically we have four minutes left. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and we'll start answering them right now. Okay, we have a question about uh, ECG, ICG waveforms where the Q and B points are not plausible or placed um, as perfectly as I had in the first slide. So not ideal to what I was showing. So uh, this person uh, often has to move the Q to the right or the B to the left. Why would this be? And again, this just has a lot to do with individual morphology. Um, can have a lot to do with electro placement, uh, a bunch of different factors. But if the B point isn't visible, then we use that, that estimation method, um, which is the percent of DZDT plus time, which is normally a constant of four milliseconds. Okay, um, next person here is having trouble measuring the distance between the two front electrodes, depending on what the participant is wearing, um, as well as give their body type, given variation size of people's chest. Do you have any advice on obtaining that measurement? What is the margin of error for measuring? Uh, how accurate does that have to be? And so uh, what we try to do is we try to control for the type of clothing that they wore during the sessions, um, you know, try to prevent any, like, 
sweaters or anything like that. Um, and then we really want to just get as close as possible. Um, being off by a few centimeters can um, change our cardiac output by quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, if we can try to get within a centimeter, um, that's usually best. And just another tip on that, what we want to do is we actually want to get the distance um, from the bottom of that top sensor to the top of the bottom sensor. So just the in-between. Um, you can also do uh, center to center, but it's usually just a little bit easier if you can feel the bottom of that, uh, where that sensor is. One thing you can also do if the, if, you know, especially if it's a female or something like that, you can have them point or hold their fingers um, right where those sensors are on them, and then you can just measure their fingers up, and that might be a little bit easier and less invasive. Um, okay, so is B point calculation method automatically set for each data set, or does it need to be changed manually depending on whether the B point confliction is apparent or not? So again, the default is percent DZT plus time. So this is our default uh, calculation method. But once you change it to something else, it will retain that setting um, until it's changed again. So if I change this over to uh, percent, uh, max slope change, because I think that might actually work better for this data set. Um, Okay, max up change. So you can see here, it actually is getting those points a lot better with the max slope change. But um, to answer your actual question, yes. Yeah, so if, if I change this here and close out of the application, open it back up, it's going to be stuck on max slope change. That may or may not be what you want. So that is, again, why I would recommend as soon as you load that file, you open that configuration that you saved um, for that starting point that you know that you want to be at. Okay, and we have a few more questions that we are going to have to um, answer afterwards because we're out of time. But I would like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we do have one more thing I want to show you here, and that is our, our training events. So what we're doing right now is the Impedance Application Webinar. We have um, a few actual seminars we're going to be holding, uh, one in June here in Columbus, and we have an Impedance um, Workshop here in September. So. If anybody is interested in coming, we they have the registration forms right there that you can fill out, and um, we're going to have uh, it's some experts there that can answer pretty much any possible question you'll have. Um, we can advise on study design. Um, if you have any data you'd like to bring, we can analyze it there. Um, so it's a very good workshop for people that are just getting into the, into psychophysiology. And then uh, we do have one more thing here. So. Uh, we have the support portal, and you will be getting a um, survey here when you close out of the webinar. So if you could please fill that out, then we can know how we did and improve on it. And that is it. So uh, again, thanks, sir, everyone, for coming, and um, hopefully we'll hear from you soon.